Devo Mahasa, Ox Forge Oroiv, or Clan Tepredorn. My name is Michael Fenton, and I will be chairing this virtual event this evening to mark the centenary of the death of Sean Tracy in Talbot Street in Dublin on the 14th of October 1920. But before we get into the presentations, I have pleasure in introducing the president of the Tipperary Association in Dublin, Liam Miles. On behalf of the association, I wish to welcome you all. It's good to be in touch in such difficult times. The association had a number of plans to hold of events in this special year, particularly with the 100th anniversary of Bloody Sunday and, of course, the 100th anniversary of the shooting of Sean Tracy. We had, in fact, commenced discussions and plans for a memorial or other suitable commemorative work to mark the shooting of Sean Tracy in Talbot Street. Unfortunately, uh, this work came to an end with the pandemic. For this reason, the association is delighted to collaborate with the Sean Tracy branch of Clotus Kyotori Ern, and particularly with the Tiberi in, in the Decade of Revolution group in this virtual event. It would, of course, be much more satisfactory to if we could have held it in the congenial atmosphere of the Palace Bar. The association is honoured and delighted that well-known Tiberi man and historian Sean Hogan has agreed to make the presentation. Sean will also refer to other par participants in the period other than Sean Tracy. Also, Nina native Ka 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 Caitlin White will make a contribution to the session after Sean. I wish to record a big thank you to Sean and his colleagues, Troy and Carl, for their help in supporting and organizing and running this event. They've put in a lot of work and we appreciate that. Thanks also to the Sean Tracy branch of Coltus Kyotori Ern, who will provide some entertainment at the end of the lecture. Enjoy the session, August Araigle Tibridorn. And now over back over to Michael Fenton, who has done a lot of work on this, who will chair the session. The format for the rest of our event is simple. We'll have two presentations, one from Sean Hogan and one from Caitlin White, and that will be followed by a discussion and question and answer session. Questions hopefully will come from you, our audience, and to do so, just send it to us via the chat icon on the bottom of your screen. And in line with GDPR, we have to advise you that we are recording this session tonight. Now, our first speaker, Sean Hogan. Sean is a well-known Tipperary historian, and his 2013 book, The Black and Tans in North Tipperary, has been described as the definitive work on North Tip in the decade from 1913 to 1922. His work is shaped by the research and interviews he did in 1980, which are survivors from that period. Sean is also part of the Tipperary in the Decade of Revolution group, who holds centenary events, when we had one here in Ashtown in Dublin last December, and they've been held in many parts of the county. Sean has been producing the centenary booklets, and although the events may have been cancelled, the booklets continue to be published. Sean has lectured extensively and has been a frequent visitor to us here in Dublin in the Palace Bar, but tonight he's with us virtually. Now, our second speaker is Caitlin White, who is also from Nina. Caitlin is currently undertaking a PhD in Trinity College, Dublin, with Dr. Anne Dolan, where she is investigating how public history was used to promote various identities in the two Irish states after partition and the effects of engaging with history on individuals. She has presented at a number of conferences, both domestic and international, and has a forthcoming chapter on public history in Nina, in an addition, the public in public places, and that's due out in next year. Now that's enough for me. So, uh, Sean, our first speaker, a regular Sean, my little holly. Thank you uh, to the Prairie Association for the invitation uh, to attend tonight. Okay, um, good evening and, and welcome to this uh, lecture and this event to remember one of our great Tipperary heroes. Um, I want to introduce or, or probably remind most of you about who Sean Tracy was and about his his short life. Uh, and his death. He was only 25 when he was killed, uh, as 
being set on the 14th of October 1920 here in Talbot Street uh, in Dublin. And essentially, I suppose what we're hoping to do is to have a fresh look at him uh, at Tracy tonight uh, and focus a little bit on the Tipperary Dublin connections during the War of Independence. Uh, could I, I welcome you all and hopefully our technology will bear up with us uh, tonight as we proceed through this. Uh, by a 16 year old young fellow who'd borrowed a uh, press camera, press photographer's camera. He was in the right place at the right time in Talbot Street, opposite the Republic Outfitters, just as the shootings happened. And he took this famous photo. Four people were killed on the street that day. Sean Tracy, we all know about. Uh, an intelligence officer, Lieutenant Gilbert Price uh, of the Crown Forces was killed. But also killed were two civilians, a man called Joseph Currigan, who was a tobacconist from Eden Key, just around the corner. And a 15 year old messenger boy named Carl were also shot dead. And several more people were wounded, uh, including the man who had grabbed Tracy, another intelligence officer was wounded as well. But perhaps even better than, than uh, Horgan's photo is the fact that Pathé News had a camera around. And we can watch for a minute here the film that they took in the aftermath of the shooting of Tracy. Uh, this is a silent movie, so I'll talk slightly over it years ago. Here we see the crowd running from the scene uh, coming up Talbot Street, uh, people moving away from the scene of the shooting. Here's an armored car, two, two truckloads of troops who were involved in the shooting and individuals going down. Probably, I think this guy is probably an intelligence officer as well coming down here. Here's the army officer conducting affairs uh, after this had just happened. And here we have the armored car on the street. See the machine gun here moving. Uh, we're not quite sure whether it was a machine gun open fire or the troops in the lorry open fire. But somebody fired a volley and killed Tracy and perhaps some of the other people who were killed there as well. Here's the troops coming out to remove the bodies. Two of the bodies, at least. Uh, we'll see them picking them up and moving them on to the things. Again, an intelligence officer or Dublin Castleman moving people away. And there's the, the lorries going off. We see a, a bicycle there on things. So I'm going to exit this now. Again, sorry to escape. Now. Uh, I go back a moment. The, the, this is Tracy, the, the portrait of, of Tracy. And I suppose he's, this is the man who's the subject of our. And we might ask ourselves about the significance of that incident in Talbot Street, the significance of the death of, of Tracy on the 14th of October 1920. But the significance arises from the fact that Tracy is one of the people who was credited with starting the War of Independence on the 21st of January 1919 at Salahed Beg. And we'll come back to discuss that. Uh, in a little while. Uh, he was one of Tipperary Big Four, as they came to be known. I'm not quite sure when that was uh, uh, appellation was applied to them, but he, that's how they were known. And they were responsible for spreading the campaign of violence in 1919 and into 1920. But the killing of Tracy, he, he was the first prominent gunman to be killed by the Crown Forces. And it was a big boost for the new intelligence services. And obviously a huge blow to the Republicans at the time. And uh, the killing may also have been a factor in, in Michael Collins' decision to go with Bloody Sunday, the killing of the intelligence agents in Dublin five weeks after Tracy was killed. The anniversary of that is coming up on 21st of November. But I suppose most of all, what we did, the killing of Tracy led to the creation of Sean Tracy, the hero, uh, and, and many of the myths around him as well. Tracy was born in uh, out near Tipperary Town. Uh, his parents were Dennis Tracy and Bridget Alice. Uh, he, his mother, his father died when he was only three years of age, returned to her people. And uh, so Tracy lived uh, near Hollyford for, for the first 11 years of his life, went to school up there. But then he returned to Summerhead uh, and attended CBS primary school. 
uh, in, in Tipperary. Uh, he was apparently an avid reader, um, uh, reserved but good-natured young fellow. Uh, he grew to be quite tall. He was five foot ten, I think, is what it is. And he was interested in the Irish language and joined the Gaelic League in Tipperary Town. And that was, was respectable. You know, he was respectable from a certain family. And Tipperary Town was, uh, we have to remember, uh, a famous, it was world brand in 1914 at the start of the Great War. It's a long way to Tipperary. It was a huge military barracks. So it was a, a huge split between, I suppose, the, the Irish speaking Republican view and the people living in the town, many of whom were dependent on the barrack. To uh, Dublin in 1916, apart from Thomas McDonough. And I suppose as an indication, of, as an indication of uh, the, the tensions between the communities, uh, something happened in Tipperary Town where uh, a colleague of Tracy's called Michael O'Callaghan, who was a local creamery manager, was attacked by a group who were complaining about the Republicans and about what had happened in Dublin. He drew a pistol and he fired and wounded a young fella. When the RAC came to arrest him, uh, he, he escaped, but he put him out of the town and he shot one of the two policemen uh, outside the town. This man, John Hurley, in the photo on the right, was the young policeman who was killed by O'Callaghan. Uh, O'Callaghan was, he went on the run, but he was shipped out of Tipperary, got to Cork and got on a ship to America uh, and went to America. But after it, a lot of Republicans were arrested in Tipperary, the more, what were considered more prominent ones. Tracy wasn't one of them, uh, but many were arrested. Then, as we move on into 1917, there was a lot of sympathy for the Republican arrested for the families of people who were being killed. And the prisoners, as always in Republican lore, are a big issue. And from 1917 on, uh, Easter 1917, the first anniversary of the Rising, you had a huge movement starting to support Sinn Féin and the Allied organisations, the Irish Volunteers, coming them on, uh, and the IRB were there in the background as well. And this is a photo of a group of young people in Tipperary who were Sinn Féin supporters in South Tipperary. They became involved in, in uh, political work and you had by-elections in a number of counties. Uh, this was typical of the Sydney in Longford, uh, De Valera in Clare, Count Duncan in Roscommon. But it really, it was the whole issue of conscription for the war in March 1918, March, April 1918, that changed Tipperary. Uh, it really changed the whole sort of view of, of people and the Sinn Féin uh, took over uh, the whole resistance to conscription. And really, what I suppose I would say about this particular period, it was this particular period that legitimised a lot of the Republican things. Young fellas could stay out. They didn't have to be home to milk the cows because they were out saving Ireland from conscription. Uh, they were able to stay away and practice being on the run. And uh, the likes of Tracy became centrally involved and he became the leader uh, of a lot of what was happening in South Tipperary. Then came the 1918 general election, December 1918, a clean sweep almost for Sinn Féin. These are the four uh, Tipperary TDs, uh, Seamus Burke, uh, Joe McDonough, brother of Thomas McDonough, PJ Maloney from Tipperary Town, Pierce McCann, and the last man is uh, Phil Shannon, who was a Tipperary man who had a pub here in Dublin, who was, uh, who was elected in 1918, uh, defeating Alfie Byrne, in fact. And these people, their mandate was not to go to, to Westminster, but to stay, formed at first all, and met on the 21st of January, 1919. And of course, that brings us to something else that happened in Tipperary on 21st of January, 1919. Here we have a photo of the, the road leading up towards Tracy's farm. There's also a quarry just around the corner here. And here's the gate. Uh, the IRA were constantly on the search for arms uh, and they heard there was Jellic Knight coming to the quarry here uh, beside Tracy's house. They decided they were going to rob the Jellic Knight. Uh, they waited here inside this gate. They waited for over a week. Uh, and when the cart with the Jellic Knight came along with two man police escort, uh, they opened fire and this man here, Constable MacDonald, who was living in Tipperary Town, was killed. And the the reaction, of course, to this, there, there are several accounts of, of what happened here. 
And the question is whether they intended to kill the policeman on the day in question or whether it was just jitters and somebody fired and one shot led to another. The two policemen were killed. And it was a huge advert for this. This was not a popular thing, shooting local policemen. It was not popular in Dublin either the same day the Dáil was meeting. This was not what they wanted. The headlines from Ireland was that two policemen had been killed in Tipperary. The story is told somewhat by Dan Breen in his book, My Fight for Irish Freedom. He has several versions, but there are many other versions of that particular day now. Tyne Crow's account, I think, is particularly significant. Here's the Tipperary Big Four. Here's Tracy in the middle, and this is the portrait that we use of him. I'm not quite sure when the portrait was taken. This is Seamus Robinson, uh, who was from Glasgow, who'd been arrested after 1916. He fought here in Dublin in 1916, was interned, but when he was released, he came to Tipperary. He became a Sinn Féin organiser. This man here is Dan Breen, uh, who was working on the railways. And uh, again, both Tracy Breen uh, and Robinson were big involved in, in developing Sinn Féin. This one here a youngster really who was uh, he did a lot of the, the gophering work for, for the other guys. Uh, he was young, he was only 17, 18 uh, on the day that Salahed Beg happened. Now you see the portrait here, unfortunately for Breen, the police had it as well, and there was a big reward. A thousand pounds was a lot of money. They were wanted for murder in Ireland, Daniel Breen. And so having the photos wasn't probably such a great idea. Hogan was a youngster. He got in trouble. He was off with a girl one night and ended up in this house, Mahers of Anfield. And uh, the police from Roskeen uh, raided this house most Monday mornings and uh, collared it. And from Thurles, he was put in the train to Cork, uh, where he was uh, obviously going to go on trial for capital murder of, of the two policemen in Salahed Bay. His colleagues, led by Tracy, decided on a rescue here in Docklong Railway Station. Uh, and they did. And they stormed into the train, led by Tracy. Tracy grappled with this man here. RAC men at the time weren't recruited for anything other than being big, strong men. Uh, Tracy was grappling with this man, Peter Wallace, in the corridor of the train. Uh, and Gunshots were exchanged again. This man, Peter Wallace, was fatally wounded. Another policeman was shot dead. Two others uh, escaped out from the scene. Uh, my colleague John Connors has written a book on this man, Sean Hogan. If any of you are interested, I'd highly commend it to you. Uh, if you want to read that story in, in full detail, John has done wonderful research, really, on that whole sort of area. After uh, our four Tipperary men were on the run. They were moving. They started here in, in Salahed Beg. Then not long happened. And then the next attack on police here was in Thurlis. District Inspector Hunt was shot dead in Thurlis. After that, you had completely out of the blue an attack on police in Lura. Then you had another attack in Thurlis, one in the Rag, one in uh, Tumivara, one in Newport. There, the dates are set out here that those attacks took place. The reason why I've charted those is each of those attacks in Norterbury, the people involved all had connections with Breen and Tracy. And so, well, I'm not so sure that the... track and trials that our, our people had. Our big four were heading for Dublin and uh, they arrived just as was the right time in September 1919. Uh, as Michael said, we, we had an event to remember one of those events that they were involved in. They, they joined Collins' squad here. They, were, they happened to arrive at the right time. These were four experienced gunmen at a time when they didn't have uh, the squad set up in Dublin. They were available to be called at short notice and they were called at short notice for an attack on the Lord Lieutenant, the highest ranking official of the British establishment in Ireland. And they attempted to assassinate him uh, at that unsuccessfully. And they lost one of their colleagues, this man, Martin Savage, was killed there. So we had an event last year uh, to, to, to do that. They were in Dublin. They were offered the same uh, approach as Callan. Did they escape to America if they wanted? But they declined that. Tracy is reputed to have said, any fool could shoot two peelers and go to America. That wasn't uh, what 
they intended to do. They intended to stay and continue on with, with the, the conflict. Life on the run. Brain describes how they were hanging around in cow houses in Tipperary, freezing in the cold, waiting for somebody to bring them a bit of food. And here's a statement from a woman called Kathleen Boland. After they arrived in Dublin, Sean Tracy arrived at our house. I never forget my feelings when I saw the condition they were in. The soles were gone from their boots. They were foot sore, weary, wet, through and hungry. We gave them a hot meal in the kitchen, describing really the reality of the, kit, the, the conditions. After their initial stint in Dublin, Tracy was back in Tipperary and became involved. The IRA were moving on from the early assassinations that they, they had undertaken to bigger events, bigger attacks at the barracks. Initially, they used gelling night, like what they'd taken in Salad Bay. This is the barracks in Drumban. Unsuccessfully, they blew off a few slates off the roof here, but didn't blow in the barrack or capture the weapons as they had hoped uh, they were going to do. Here's a picture from, or a drawing of the attack in Rear Cross, again, where Tracy was. Tracy involved in a number of these, Hollyford and Strangham and Rear Cross. And while they succeeded in boarding a number of the barracks, these were strategic, not strategic, but more propaganda uh, victories. Tracy was involved in the Ula ambush in July, 1920. And again, I highlight this because Tracy was the kind of character who was thinking about the situation, what resources they had and what they could do. They weren't well armed, but he was moving things on again. And the Ula ambush was one of the first ambushes on a military convoy, a mobile military convoy, well known because General Lucas was involved in it. General Lucas, that's a story for another night perhaps. Uh, again, one of the things that demonstrates Tracy was the leader of the IRA group in that. And again, I think he proved himself sort of individual who was cool under the pressure. They, they came under fire there at that time and he was able to uh, provide covering fire with his automatic as, as uh, his troops, uh, his, his volunteers withdrew. Towards September 1920, Tracy is back in Dublin. Uh, he was engaged to be married, we understand, to a woman called May Quigley. This woman, she had visited him regularly when he was in prison in his earlier career and the marriage plan for the end of October. There were many houses that they went to in Tipperary, or in Tipperary houses in Dublin, Kilshannon's pub, Jim Kirwan's pub, Fleming's here in Jumcondra, where, near where I live, and several other houses as well that the Tipperary men uh, could visit. But things weren't all going their own way. The net was tightening. After their initial spate of attacks on the Crown forces, uh, the British decided they were going to fight back and they brought over the Auxiliary Division. These were absolutely well-armed officers who were brought over and given the brief to take murder by the throat. And Michael, you'll, you'll be aware that these are a, a group that were in the Lakeside Hotel in Killaloo, and you'll be aware that the anniversary of the centenary of the killing of the four IRA volunteers and the bridge between Ballina and Killaloo happens on the 16th of November coming, uh, just a few days away. Uh, these were tough group and well armed, as I say, and uh, they, they joined, I suppose, with a network of people who were watching IRA men for them. And people like Breen and Tracy were taking risks here in Dublin. They were out openly uh, in Dublin and their notoriety from the early uh, attacks that they had led and been involved in had gained them a huge notoriety. So they were a big target, really, for these auxiliaries and the intelligence officers. This is the weapon that Tracy favoured, the Mauser C-96. It's a German uh, automatic weapon. Uh, not a magazine weapon, but could be reloaded from the top here with a 10 shot that could slap down ammunition. So he was able to, to, to get a lot of uh, gunfire fire out. And this was his favourite weapon, the one he used in several of the events he was involved in. Now we're back to the drum conjure connection here. Uh, Tracy and... and uh, uh, Tracy and Breen were in, in Dublin on the 11th of October, uh, 1920. Breen had a good day at the bookies and they went to the movies and they met a woman from Drumcondra here, Dot Fleming. And they came back with her on the tram to Fleming's house here in Drumcondra. That's between Fagan's and uh, Kennedy's pubs here was where Fleming's was. They arrived back there. They got some food there. They knew they'd been tailed coming back on that night. So they went out the back onto Botanic Avenue and headed up out further out up towards uh, further out from Conjuro to stay in a house 
called Fernside out there was where they were heading for. Fernside is up past St. Patrick's College is where it is. This is a picture of Fernside, the house uh, as it stands at the moment, uh, where they were staying. The information had gone back into Dublin Castle that there was two men here seen going into this house. A uh, party of uh, intelligence officers left with troops, left Dublin Castle, surrounded the house about one o'clock, banged on the door, were let in by the man who owned the door, Professor Carlin, and came in shouting up the stairs, uh, looking, shouting for Ryan. They were told there was a man called Ryan there. But what they were met was with a hail of gunfire from Tracy using his Mauser. Uh, Breen was wounded, I think, very early on in this exchange. Uh, and in the exchange of fire, Tracy killed two of the intelligence officers who came in to, to, to this. They succeeded in jumping out the back window at the back here. They were in a room at the back of the house, jumped out the back, fell through a glass house, were badly cut. Breen was badly wounded as well, but got out the back and escaped. And just going back to the previous one, this is Breen made his journey way down the back of St. Patrick's College, crossed the Dodder River here and got into a house here on Botanic Avenue. Extraordinary feat for the man who, who was wounded. Here's two of the people who were killed, uh, Major Smith and uh, A.P. Price. And this is uh, an inquiry was held. We're not going to go into that tonight, I think. Tracy's last days then were spent after he escaped from Fernside. He, he walked to Finglas and he stayed out there. Then he came back over to Inchicore and stayed with some of the Dublin squad, the IRA Conservancy Unit. But on the day uh, before he was killed, he was here. One of his favourite haunts was here in Grantham Street. And then, uh, uh, lived here in Grantham Street. And there was another house, Delaney's here uh, in, in Hatesbury Street, where they stayed as well. And uh, those were the sort of areas that he was in. He was back in the centre of town trying to look after Breen. The Dublin volunteers took Breen, were trying to mind him, were trying to get him into the Vatter Hospital to be treated. He was being kept up in North Charles Street and being anaesthetized with whiskey uh, to keep him. And he was there for about 36 hours before we could get him into the hospital. So Tracy was involved with that as well. His last hours were uh, spent here, were showing here uh, Parnell Street now. Uh, uh, Street, as it was. And this is an area where a lot of IRA operations went on here around uh, Grand Bureau, which is, is now um, uh, Parnell Square here. And a lot of Collins' squad, a lot of them were based in several houses up here, up on Great Denmark Street and places like that. So Tracy was in this area. He went in here, he collected, uh, he looked for a bicycle and a coat, and he got a bicycle and a coat here in uh, Jim Kirwan's pub in and things and said that this is all the ILAC center now, but at that time it was a, a network of lanes frequently used by Collins and others uh, for their activity uh, that they had going on here. He headed off to meet Dick McKee, the OC of the Dublin Brigade, in uh, a shop down in Talbot Street. And that's what we've seen uh, later on. These are the final moments. This is the shop he was going to, the Republican Outfitters, uh, which was perhaps a strange place for them to be meeting, but they were. That's where, where he was meeting. He met three or four other people there. And suddenly they heard the troops coming around the corner, uh, the lorry load of troops. Uh, several of them escaped. Tracy tried to jump on a bicycle to escape. It was grabbed by one of the intelligence officers. And then with what we saw at the beginning, uh, a burst of gunfire. He was killed in the burst of gunfire that happened there. The technology has sort of let me down now. And so far as I wanted to show you a photo of Nora O'Keefe, but hopefully what I can do, if you can see this one, not sure if my camera is still functioning here, guys. Uh, that's uh, Nora Keith was a cousin of Tracy's, but she was the woman who had to go and identify his body. She was a young woman from one of the Keiths of Glenock. One of the Keiths of Glenock. This was the, the book uh, by uh, historian uh, Mary McAuliffe and Margaret Skinner, and I'll come back to explain that. She was uh, went to America in 99, but she was on the activists here of that generation of activists here in Dublin in uh, through the four or five years of the War of Independence. Um, Mary McCall's biography I hold here because, which was very interesting uh, because it introduces uh, Margaret Skinner and, and Nora O'Keefe were partners uh, for their life after. And uh, this was just hidden aspects of the, the lives. And she's certainly one of the lives that's worth uh, exploring and explaining, one of the temporary people who was here in Dublin. Another one worth 
school in uniform. This is the Tipperary team who replayed the bloody Sunday match. It was replayed in June 1922. Here in the middle, you'll see sitting Dan Breen uh, in the center here of this. This man is called D.P. Walsh. And, uh, he was the man that Tracy met, uh, was going to meet down in Phil Shannon's pub. And I, I often wondered about him. I never could never find out anything. But fortunately, after I published my book, I met his family and uh, Jerry Lowry and, and Donald Lowry. And they gave me a whole heap of papers about this man. He was called the GAA and uh, was one of Collins' in fact, henchmen, lieutenants. Uh, a very interesting story uh, worthy of, of pursuing in its own way. Uh, but unfortunately for him, after this photo was taken with Green, who was anti-treaty, uh, just this is just two weeks before the start of the Civil War, he was arrested by Ono Duffy when he went back to barracks and was detained, and that was the end of his career. He was in the Fifth Army. This is the photo of famous photo of Dan Breen marrying Bridget Malone, Sean Hogan, and that. At the same time, this was in June 21. Uh, here was two men who were hanged for not long. Ned Foley and Pat Maher were hanged around that time uh, as well. The aftermath of the shooting, Tracy was brought home um, on the train from Dublin. Uh, D.P. Walsh was involved in organising the funeral and he was brought back uh, to Tipperary Town to Salahad Beg to the church. And uh, it was obviously a huge procession for his funeral from there to the graveyard in Kilpeakle where he was buried. It was a huge military presence uh, in Kilfeekle as well, uh, which obviously uh, it was a big, a huge event on, at the time. Now, can we reappraise Sean Tracy after 100 years? We're in the decade of centenaries. And I think there's, there's many of the general myths that need to be, we need to things, the, the role of assassinations versus the flying columns and the ambushes and whatever. Really, the driving things in this were the Crown Forces retaliations were huge here. So I think we have to look at the dynamics of the revolutionary violence at the time. And Tracy was centrally involved in that dynamic. He was the key figure in starting and spreading the War of Independence. He was a central figure in things like the barrack attacks, the attacks on mobile columns, the ambushes. Tracy was, was on that. But it's worth, I think, reflecting if he was on a treadmill. Once that first shot was fired in Salahed Beg, were they reacting always? rather than working to a plan. Uh, Tracy, we can trace his involvement in 20 or more deaths in the 20 months that he was involved in the War of Independence. As a leader, he had a huge role in the development phase, 1917, 18, 19. Uh, he was worked with people and was hugely respected by people in Tipperary. He led the actions himself. He was a, a leader from the front. Uh, he was involved in the brigade command, and that's a, an open question really on that one. Survival was, was the key here, really, that, that the survival of, of uh, their, themselves really was the group. You have to bear in mind, they didn't know how this was going to end. We know how it ended and how it ended in a truce, but they didn't know at the time that it was going to end in, in a truce uh, a couple of uh, months later. So it's hardly surprising to the reports that suggest that as Tracy came near his end, he was suffering from fatigue the pressures, maybe even the guilts. The man he stayed with in, in Drumcondra, Professor Carlin, was wounded and died of his, his wounds uh, a, few, a few weeks later. There are some reports that he may have been uh, depressed. And, and I suppose we, we talk now about post-traumatic stress. And so there's some question that his judgment uh, was impaired right at the very end. But that didn't stop or doesn't stop from creating Sean Tracy the hero. And he's a hero, not just in Tipperary. And this is perhaps a, a classic of turning uh, defeat into victory. Um, this started from the time of his, his death in October 21. Uh, Breen's book obviously created the hero, reinforced by Desmond Ryan's book. And so that has gone on. So uh, he's remembered in many places as well too. So what I've tried to do here is take a, a quick uh, view through Tracy's life, which introduces some aspects of the things. There are many perspectives on Tracy's particular story. I suppose what I'm hoping is in doing this is not just remembering Tracy, but remembering the people who made history. There was a whole generation who gave up five or six years for Ireland. And some like Tracy gave up their lives. So this event is about remembering those people. Thank you very much.
Right, Caitlin. Uh, now you might give us your perspective on commemorations. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, and I'm just going to start sharing um, my screen here. So, Gurv Mina got Sean um, for a very interesting talk um, on Sean Tracy, who is one of the most well-known figures in Ireland's fight for independence and especially among people in Tipperary. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the Tipperary Association of Dublin, um, Gohara Liam August Michael, and the Sean Tracy branch of Coaltis Curol Tori Naheran, and Tipperary in the Decade of Revolutions group as well for organising tonight's event. Not only to commemorate Sean Tracy, but to offer space as well to reflect on those commemorations, which is what I'm going to be doing for the next 10 minutes or so. So, increasingly topical, um, as Michael mentioned at the start in the, in the past number of years, commemorations have long been a feature of Irish life. Indeed, the political power of commemorations was recognised by all sides involved in the War of Independence and Civil War, with a flurry of commemorative activity evident in the 1920s and 1930s in Ireland. In the case of the Cenotaph erected by the Common Gael government commemorating the memories of Michael Collins and Arthur Griffith, it was commissioned within two months of the IRA order to dump arms, which signaled the end of civil war. So in a country emerging from a bitter conflict, the need to commemorate and stake claim to the memory of the fallen was critical. In speaking of this, I feel that I need to acknowledge that there's a distinct difference between remembering and commemorating. To commemorate collectively confers honor and distinction to the person or event being commemorated and should be treated with great sensitivity. This became glaringly obvious to both the Irish public and the Irish government with the public backlash that was expressed in January 2020, following the announcement of a commemorative ceremony for the Royal Irish Constabulary in Dublin. Commemorations, as well as bestowing honour onto an individual or event, can also serve as an opportunity for society, as on Tukturon Michael D. Higgins acknowledges here. He has spoken at length about commemoration during his term as president and advocated for ethical commemoration of the past. This type of commemoration, according to President Higgins, seeks to respect the context and complexity, as well as the integrity of the motivations of the men and women of the past. Whether ethical or not, commemorations say a lot more about the people staging them than about the people or events they themselves commemorate. Rather than offering us a window into the past, commemorations provide us with a mirror to our present. They provide a very practical function as well. Commemorations are central to the creation and consolidation of group identities. They unite people under the banner of a goal or idea, and they use the past to validate their own aims or even their very existence. However, by the definition of uniting one group, they consequently ostracize others. And it's this division of memory, this tension, as well as how memories and commemorations are constructed that I'll reflect on this evening. Another important distinction that I want to make before I go any further is that history and the past are not one and the same. The past is all the events that happened in a time before the present moment, while history is how we choose to retell those events. History is shaped by the teller, or in other words, written by the victor. And so in a history of the events of the decade of revolution in Ireland, we find a plethora of heroes. James Connolly, Constance Markiewicz, Tom Kettle, Helena Maloney, Frank Ryan, Sean Tracy, Michael Collins. When talking about heroes of modern Irish history, your heroes can betray your political sympathies. But why is there a need for heroes of villains when the lives we lead are infinitely more complex than that? For the next couple of minutes, I just want to look at two widely accepted heroes of this period and consider the ownership of their memory in the public sphere. Both are men and both will be known to you all. The first is Michael Collins, the second, Sean Tracy. Collins was granted the status of hero in life, a status he was conscious of and cultivated to his own advantage. So it was no surprise when this status was elevated even further on his death in August 1922. Tracy also enjoyed the popularity and respect of those who knew him and those who fought alongside him. They were both young men, full of passion and ideas, who fought for Ireland's cause and died in gunfire as soldiers, sacrificing themselves for the cause. Both had sweethearts or fiancés, but neither were married, further emphasising the tragedy of the loss of their young lives. And crucially, the main difference between these men, or more accurately, the mem between the memory of these men, is who claimed their allegiance after their death. Collins, as Commander-in-Chief of the Free State Army and signatory of the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921, belonged firmly in the Free State camp. 
to solidify that connection, the Cumann Gael government erected the aforementioned monument, the cenotaph pictured here, to the memory of Collins and Arthur Griffith on Leinster Lawn. He died a pro treatyite Free State Soldier of Ireland. The annual state commemorations at the cenotaph took place from 1923 until 1932, when Fianna Fáil came into power, and from 1924 at Balenham Law. Tracy, who died before the outbreak of civil war, was commemora commemorated annually from his first anniversary in 1921 in Kilfika graveyard, where he is buried, where he is buried by his comrades from the Third Tipperary Brigade, who formed the Third Tipperary Brigade Commemoration Committee, which is a bit of a mouthful. While we can hazard an educated guess, it's impossible for any of us to say for certain what side Sean would have taken in the civil war. His personal writings, the opinions of his closest friends and his unwavering commitment to the cause of Ireland would suggest that he would have joined the anti-treaty forces. But it's impossible for any historian to, ascertain this to assert this fact without absolute certainty. Had places been switched, had Collins died in 1920, would we have said the same about him? In the absence of a wife, a Muriel McSweeney type figure to give voice to the wishes of a dead husband, this responsibility fell to his former comrades, his friends and his confidants. No less so than today, when the partner and siblings of George Floyd addressed the global Black Lives Matter movement and directed the tide of grief to political action, the words of those who were closest to the fallen hero carried significant weight. As those who spoke at the graveside of Tracy over the years, such as PJ Maloney and Dan Breen, aligned themselves to Fianna Fáil, so too did Tracy's memory. However, I argue that despite the memories of each of these men belonging in a semi-official capacity through commemorative events to either Fianna Fáil or Cumann Gael, it's the ability of the memories of them to cross the political divide and appeal to the wider nationalist community that enables them to be considered heroes of the past in the way that Rory O'Connor or Kevin O'Higgins never could. As Anne, Do as Anne Dolan put it, following the Civil War, commemoration could never be simple again. The veneration of their memory as heroes is problematic. In the creation and commemoration of the hero, the flaws and faults that made these men ordinary human beings can get lost. They become an idealized version of inspiration, a myth to aspire to rather than, the ordinary, peop rather than ordinary people who did extraordinary things. The commemoration and ownership of an event as separate to an individual is equally as problematic. So while on a macro level, ownership can seem easy to assign, so for example, this photo here is of um, a commemoration of the 1916 rise and this belongs to the people of Ireland. An examination on a more micro level provides more questions than answers, as in when in the 1930s there were three political parties, Fianna Fáil, Cumann Na Gain and Sinn Féin, all claimed ownership of 1916 because they were all headed by men who took part in it. They participated in what Dermot Ferriter has termed as a scramble over the, de the, scramble over the bones of the patriot dead to strengthen their own political stand and position. To this end, the 1935 state commemoration of the 1916 Rising included a reenactment of the beginning of the Easter Rising and placed Eamon de Valera as a commander in chief and stationed in the GPO when 19 years earlier he had in fact been a commandant stationed in Boland's Mills. Events in general can provide more scope for people to choose aspects to identify with as they are multifaceted and subject to interpretation. While the Easter Rising has been commemorated every year since 1917, including a period of time during the Troubles when it wasn't commemorated by military parade, but in more subdued ways, the focus of commemoration has not remained static. Emphasis has shifted to reflect the current affairs of the day and concerns, and for the recent centenary, the role of women and labour history was more prominent than in previous years, with a strong focus on the contribution of the ordinary person. In this way, the memory of events can be more malleable than those of a person, and new generations can identify aspects that resonate with them. It's through this intergenerational engagement with commemoration that creates lasting significance and provides a solid link between past, present and future generations. However, when talking about the commemoration of events, I am conscious that while we're in the decade of centenaries, we're also, we've also recently entered a period of important 50th anniversaries of events that happened during the Troubles. While we prepare to mark the centenary of Bloody Sunday 1920, uh, the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday 1972 will not be so easily approached. I acknowledge that the commemorations I speak about here are specific to the 26 counties and that a different approach is needed in Northern Ireland. So it's here that we look down the never ending rabbit hole of memory theory. Um, since the Second World War, and I, I will make this brief, since the Second World War, there has been a cosmopolitan approach to memory. And this approach insists that consensus is required, consensus is required to reconcile and without it, there is no progress. 
This approach also prioritizes the narrative of the victim. It facilitates the creation of heroes and encourages communities on both sides of a conflict to perpetuate a narrative of victimhood. This in turn ensures that neither group appreciate or engage with the history of the other. And this, I believe, is where commemoration in 2020 and beyond can contribute to change. A new mode of remembrance has been proposed called agonism. Agonism accepts that we may never as a society reach consensus. It accepts that co conflict is a necessary and sometimes useful fact of life. And most importantly, it rejects the notion of heroes. But what does this mean for us? We as speakers and audience and organizers here tonight are participants in commemoration. We have identified an individual that we believe encapsulates our ideals and values, and we choose to honor his memory. But I strongly believe that there's a balance to be struck between veneration and commemoration, not just for Sean Tracy or Michael Collins, but for anyone who enjoys the status of hero. That is not to say that we no longer remember, honor, or feel proud of the actions of the revolutionary generation, the men and women who fought to free Ireland from oppression, but rather that we acknowledge their flaws and faults, that we take them down from their pedestals, we look at them, warts and all, and still feel proud of their achievements or ideals anyway. I believe that this is a greater honor to their memory, that we embrace their multifaceted lives and acknowledge that they, like us, were ordinary people who made mistakes, misjudgments, and sometimes did immoral things, but who lived in extraordinary times. This, the approach of agonism, is perhaps the next stage of engaging with our past, and with this comes new possibilities for our future. If we can engage different communities in what is perceived to be our past that we own, and if we ourselves can engage in theirs, then perhaps the goal that men and women fought for 100 years ago might be closer than before. And personally, I couldn't think of a better way to commemorate them than that. Gurev Mila Mahagov, Osvor Nard, Tomig Tnugu Morlesh, and Playogs Nikeshna. Oh, good meal, my good, good meal, my good, Caitlin. That was uh, quite a lot there for us to take in, I can tell you, more than perhaps we were expecting, but uh, fantastic nonetheless. Now, uh, we have some questions, and maybe if uh, Sean and Caitlin could uh, have their microphones unmuted, uh, I can start with one or two that I've been already. Um, First one I think it would be for you, Sean. Uh, how did Sean Tracy get to Dublin and what day is in October? That comes uh, I think I, I, I wouldn't have exact dates, but I think he came back up in September. So he, he'd they'd been up and down, moving up and down, and he may well have been thinking of heading back down to Tipperary. There was reasons for him to go back into Tipperary as well as to be in Dublin. So we're not quite sure what the, the movements are. And, uh, uh, the plans would have been fluid, I would say, at the time. So I, I couldn't tell you the exact dates. Uh, we know he was killed on the 14th. We know he was in Fernside here on the 11th, 12th that night, um, the night of the 11th, Monday night into Tuesday. Uh, but I think the general accepted is that he came back uh, in in um, in September. There, there was the personal aspects as well that he, he was he was uh, you know um, we, we understand to be married uh, to make quickly. So you know I'm sure there, there was things to be organised and arranged, trying to arrange a wedding. We, we've seen the work that went into Breen, uh, Dan Breen's wedding at Bridget Malone in Tipperary later on. So presumably there would have had to be uh, some work done around that as well too. But Sean, why did they come to Dublin in the first place? It probably is another part of that question. Uh, was there not enough for them to be doing down in Tip? Well, there was lots to do in Tip, but as you'll have seen, the, uh, life on the run was very difficult for them in Tipperary, in South Tipperary. Uh, Breen's description, if you read Breen's book or, or John Connor's book about Sean Hogan, the, the hardships that they faced, the cold, the wet, and being constantly hunted, uh, going to houses where they thought they might get shelter and didn't get shelter. If they were lucky they got put out in the cow house and, and left in the cow house, uh, but they had to move on directly. So Breen had decided they weren't going to be able to stick that. So they came to Dublin. Dublin, I suppose, proved to be an attractive sort of life for them. There was bookies, there was cinema that we'd go to, we've seen, you know, and, and today, and things like that, as well, and, but they were available then for operations. The big question, was over Tracy, uh, is he in his role as vice uh, and, and James Robinson, if they were out of the county, who was running South, the IRA in South Tipperary then? And that was a big question, because from Salahid Beg uh, to Knock Long, after Knock Long, the next policeman wasn't killed in Tipperary until May 19, South Tipperary, until May 1920 whereas 10 policemen have been killed in North or Minterbury. So there's a question mark over, you know, the role as, as the officer in, in the Secretary Brigade. 
Yeah. Sorry, Caitlin, can I just, uh, another one, a few more coming in directly to me rather oh. than coming on the chat. Okay. Uh, in 1922, uh, we'll have the Civil War, and that comes into the area of commemoration. How is that going to be handled? Would that not be a difficult one? Um, I think it's going to be really difficult. Um, and I don't think it's for historians to tell people how it should be handled either. Um, I think it's up to historians to provide the information and for people to choose how they want to commemorate it themselves. Um, now, I think that what happened in January, just gone with the, the kind of debacle over the, the RIC commemoration was actually a really helpful and useful thing to happen because it was an incident where the government varied from the advice given to them by the expert advisory committee. Um, and I don't know if they would vary far from it again after the backlash that they received. No. Um, but this might be something, Sean, that, that you've thought on as well, because Sean has done a lot of work um, on commemorations, especially around Tipperary. Yeah, uh, I, I, I would, uh, Caitlin, uh, Michael, I would say at the time of that controversy back in January, we, we were hosting an event in Thurles. And uh, in that we were remembering uh, the killing by the IRA of two RIC men and the killing of an IRA man by RIC. And, uh, you know, we as historians, I think we our job was to describe the story, to tell the story of what happened. But when we held our event on the 25th of January this year, we, we, we said to people, look, and I think it was a phrase you used, Kate, there, there's different perspectives on that history. And all we ask as the people who are organizing this event is that you respect it or other uh, perspectives. So you have families, descendants of RIC people there, you have families of the IRA people who were involved in killing them there, you have the families of the IRA men who were killed there, all present with many different views and, and variations of views in between, them, you know, several generations on now. So all we asked was that people respect uh, that there are other views uh, of the event. There's no single sort of view of what happened in Thurnus that day. And my job was really is to put that in writing in our centenary booklet. So we tell the story in the booklet. Uh, different people will walk away with that booklet with a different view of that. And that's OK. That's, you know, people have different views, different perspectives, as Caitlin has said about that. But I, I do point to that one in Thurlis. And I think uh, Martin Manzer was there that day as well, too, and commented particularly, I think, on the approach that we were trying to take in terms of this. I think if we don't get to that, then things like the Civil War are going to become very problematic. Like if we can't get to a, to a space like that. Yeah, so if I can go back and just uh, a note from Kathleen Cleary. Uh, of course, we know that uh, the Friends of Sean Tracy uh, did he have a commemoration uh, in Tarbell Street uh, at 4.15 on, on, the, on that exact date. And there were many of us there who were present at the time. Uh, and they also had a Zoom meeting on October 18th. Uh, and the third Tipperary Brigade held a commemoration ceremony in Kilfeagle uh, that was held in accordance with government guidelines. Uh, yes, sir, to... if, I, if I might comment, my, mm -hmm. they've been uh, hosting events to remember Tracy every year. It's probably mm -hmm. for 100 years is one of Tracy's, the commemoration of Tracy and, and the committee, the work that they've done, you know, has been one that's been continuous for 100 years, really, in terms of the work that's been done in terms of events around Tracy. Yeah, Seamus wants to know why Sean Tracy was buried in Kilfeagle. Uh, I presumed that there was family connections uh, into Kilfeagle. Why, why they're buried there, I, I don't know the family uh, lore to that extent. Yeah, and uh, Carl wants to know, um, did, he, did uh, Sean Tracy get any help from the people in, in the Republican Outfitters when they were attacked that day? Do we know anything about that attack when they were... Uh, yeah, he, he was in that. meeting. Uh, he was meeting Dick McKee, the, the OC of the Dublin Brigade, and, and two or three others in there. Uh, they heard the troops coming. They, they ran. Tracy ran. He had been given the bicycle. Apparently, he went to try and get on this bicycle outside the, the place. But as he did try to get on the bicycle, he was grabbed by an intelligence officer uh, who was either on the street or, or run up and, and caught him and held him, pulled him off the bicycle. And Tracy was grappling with this man uh, when either the machine gun or the troops in the lorry fired a volley that killed uh, another intelligence officer, killed Tracy, killed the two civilians and wounded, uh, there's two or three other people who were wounded badly uh, on the day as well too. And Sean, I think it's just worth pointing out um, that the Republican Outfitters, uh, even with its 
very obvious name. It didn't have a back door. So that's why they ran out the front door and everyone went out the one the one exit. Yeah. It, it was Padre Clancy's uh, shop. Uh, that was his shop. That's where he did. But to, it was used as a, one of the meeting places. They, they came and went there. But was well, it not a very obvious place for, for the, people, the British forces to be watching? Uh, sure, not, uh, rather, sure. I won't say a, 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 an obvious place to be going. It, it may well have been. It may well have been. But there, there had been a complete step up in the British intelligence system. Uh, had completely tried to strengthen their, their intelligence operations. And so you had a whole bunch of new intelligence officers on the street. In Dublin here, you also had people who were watching, who were paid. And after Tracy here in Drumcondra, where we are, where, uh, where Flemings near where Flemings was, a man was, was shot in June 1921, and part of the charge against him was that he'd been to town, which followed Tracy and Breen that night here in Fernside. Uh, a man called Robert Pike was, was taken. He lived in was little cottages by the Botanic, uh, down in Botanic Avenue here. Uh, he was taken out and shot uh, by the IRA for touting, uh, as it were. But there would have been lots of people providing information to town forces, uh, not just the town forces themselves in the street. So, and it was high risk. It was high risk, particularly for someone like Breen and Tracy, um, you know, who were, were known. The photo of Breen was around. I think Breen was more recognised uh, by by people on the street, really. But Caitlin, would you say from a histor historian's point of view that that was a stupid thing for them to do, to go to such an obvious place? Um, history. I mean, I mean, it seems to us now, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, but... Um, one of the things, one of the other things that I do is, is tour guide, guiding. And one of the things that people often ask me about, you know, how come people didn't notice that the 1916 rise and there was volunteers marching down the street. When we're kind of casting our mind back to 100 years ago, we have to remember that society was was very militarised. Um, and so places like the Republican Outfitters, while it does seem like an obvious name, um, it may not have been as standoutish as we might think it today. Around. I have a, a, a strange one here from Michael Hurley, a friend of mine, but he, he obviously is being contrary. He wants to know roughly how many cl clubs across the world are named after Sean Tracy. They're saying he has a tremendous influence on the GA clubs and how many are there? Now, I, I, I don't know if either of you are capable of doing that, but funnily enough, I got a text in from Sean Nugent, a good friend of ours, who says that the Sean Tracy Club in Holyford, that we all know, Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, he says there's one in Lurgan, there's one in San Francisco, and there's one in Australia. Well, now, Mike, if you're listening, that's 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 four for you as first start off. I'm sure there are more. Uh, They're just the GA ones, Michael. Don't forget that our Sean Tracy branch of Colt is here as well, too. That are, yes, Sean, are and we'll be hearing from them very shortly. I'm afraid uh, that's all the time we have for questions tonight. Before I hand you over to the music, could I, on behalf of the Tipperary Association and our President Liam Miles, thank our speakers, Sean Hogan and Caitlin White, Sean Murphy and the Sean Tracy Cortis Group, the Tipperary in the Decadent Revolution Group, Tri, Carl and Keir for helping us behind the scenes, and especially to you, our viewers, who have joined us. And now to the music from the Cortis Group. First, we have a song from the Maguire family. So we have Eva who's singing. She's joined by her mom Anne, her dad Dermot, and brother Kieran. This is a song I think we all know well.
family. Now I will leave you and for the next 25 minutes or so you'll be entertained by the Sean Tracy branch of Cortus Curatori Erin. Umsha, Ihawa, Kodeshi Sloan, Agus Araigle Tubridarn. The Sean Tracy branch of Cortus was founded in Moran's Hotel at the corner of Talbot Street and Gardner Street in 1970. When looking for a name for the new branch, they were reminded that Sean Tracy, the Tipperary born volunteer and fiddle player, was shot on Talbot Street in 1920, close to where they were meeting. The branch was named in his honour. 50 years later, our branch is one of the largest and most active branches of Coltus in Dublin. We have gathered together some of our young musicians to entertain you tonight with some tunes. and strong. No surrender was his war cry. Fight on lads, no retreat. Brave Tracy cried before he died, shot down in Talbot Street. Perfect. We open our performance with a barn dance. Warren plays a slow air called Queena e Neil, a lament for the great Ulster chieftain.
And now, Murin is joined by Saif to play two reels, George People's Reel and on Kaharua. We follow with a set of jigs, Dara on pipes and Fierka on fiddle play two jigs, Young Tom Ennis and Munster Buttermilk.
Dara plays the slow air Sleeve Naman on the Illum Pipes, a tune well known to all Tipperary people. It relates to the failed 1798 Rising. Fiacra and Sive play two hornpipes on fiddles, the Pleasures of Hope and the Western Hornpipe. Sean Tracy was a fiddle player and his fiddle is on display in Brew Baru, the coldest building in Cashel, County Tipperary.
Our musicians play two reels to finish, The Morning Dew and The Bells of Tipperary. Our musicians for tonight were Muran Nimuel Darag on harp, Saif Nikarton on fiddle, Fiakra Mackay on fiddle, and Dara O'Muel Darag on the Illum Pipes. <laughs> 